Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Varsity Tutors Star Course Series, where today we've created a community to collaborate and learn about how insects learn and collaborate in their communities. And we're joined today by entomology expert Abby Leonard, better known on TikTok as Entomology Abby, who's going to be helping us open the door into the incredible insect societies underground and flying all around. Now, before we get started, there are just a few quick things to note. It wouldn't be a good class about collaboration and teamwork if we didn't have some opportunity to collaborate and learn from one another today. So Abby's gonna have some questions for you throughout today's lesson, and you'll likely have some questions for her too. Feel free to use the chat on the right-hand side of the screen to both ask and answer questions throughout the lesson. And you're even welcome to share something that you learned on any of the social media posts that we're going to tag at the end of today's lesson. Now, we'll also wanna be sure that we are prepared to interact in some of the formal questions that Abby will be asking us throughout the lesson. So again, feel free to use that chat, whether it is for some direct questions throughout class or to interact with some Q&A toward the end of the lesson. And with that, I'm gonna hand things over to everyone's favorite TikTok entomologist, Abby Lunner. Hi, everyone. I am so excited to be chatting with you all today about insect societies. As Haley said, I am an entomologist, which means I study insects. And even more specifically, I study bees. So before we get started, I want you to go ahead and let me know in the chat where you're tuning in from and what your favorite bug is. I'm currently in Colorado and my favorite bug is of course bees, but I also love beetles. And oh my gosh, it looks like we have students from all over. It looks like we could almost have all 50 states. This is awesome. It's so exciting to see people tuning in from everywhere. And lots of people like bees like me too. Woo love to see it. <laughs> like Haley said also, anytime during the talk, feel free to use that chat box to ask me questions and we'll answer them all together at the end. And anytime you see this blue answer in the chat, that is when I'm asking you a question and that's your clue to drop some responses in the chat as well. So when we delve into insect societies today, I'm going to be addressing four main questions. Those are, what is sociality? What are different types of sociality? What insects are social? And what adaptations can social insects have? So let's go ahead and get into it. First of all, it's important that we understand what sociality is before we can delve into insect sociality and what exactly that means. And to put it very simply, sociality is the interaction between animals. For example, here on the left, we have a herd of buffalo and a herd is a great example of sociality. These animals all interact with one another, they communicate, and then on the right here, we have a flock of swans, which is another social group of animals. So let's talk about how humans are social to get some ideas about the ways that insects might be social. The first thing is really simple, talking, communicating. Communication is a really big part of how we as people are social, but also potentially a big part of how animals are social too. Another way that we as people are social is by taking care of our babies and our children. Lots of animals have babies and don't care for them the same way that we do. So this is another layer of sociality. The next way people are social is that we build communities together. We have houses and apartments and condos in neighborhoods, and we'll live with our parents, siblings, grandparents, aunts and uncles, roommates. This is all a very social behavior that people have. The last example I'll give about how humans are social is that we have different jobs that contribute to our communities. Jobs like firefighters, teachers, doctors, lawyers, scientists, they all help other people make the world a better place, right? 
So this is also an example of a way that people are social. So I'm going to have you drop into the chat how you think bugs and people are similar when it comes to sociality. We gave a couple of examples of how humans are social. So do you think that any of these things apply to bugs as well? And lots of answers are coming in. It looks like lots of people are saying that insects and people both live in communities and that insects communicate with each other just like people do. These are all awesome answers. Okay, so let's talk exactly about how insects are social. As some of you guessed, insects do communicate with each other, but they don't use words like we do, of course. Insects communicate using something called pheromones. Pheromones are chemicals released by insects that other insects come in contact with and receive a message. So in the photo on the screen here, I have a bee with really long antennae. And his long antennae are how he receives other insects' pheromones to learn what they're communicating. So for example, some bees will release something called alarm pheromones when they think that there is a threat nearby. And then this signals to other bees that there's a threat and they need to defend a hive potentially. Another way insects can be social is by taking care of their babies. Here, um, I have some honeybees on what are called brood cells. So in a honeybee hive, each of these uh, little caps in the honeycomb have a baby bee inside that the honeybees are taking care of. And they make sure that the brood stays nice and clean and that those babies are protected. Insects can also live in communities just like we do. Insects definitely don't build houses and apartments, but they still build structures to live in together. So this is a photo of a termite mound in Africa. Termites uh, spent a lot of time building this structure to live in together, and there can be thousands of termites all inside of one mound, all living together. And if you hadn't guessed already, Insects also have different jobs like people do. This is a worker ant collecting food for its colony, but there are also ants that take care of the queen or protect the colony. So social insects can have jobs just like people do. Now, there are lots of different types of sociality. In fact, here is just a few of them, but don't get too overwhelmed with all of these different types because we are going to focus on these four levels of sociality, solitary, subsocial, communal, and eusocial. And we're gonna talk about exactly what those levels of sociality mean and what different traits that those insects have. So first up, is solitary insects. Solitary insects are the lowest possible level of sociality. They do communicate with other insects, but they don't take care of their babies, they um, don't live all together, and they don't have different jobs. So an example of a solitary insect is this fly. The fly doesn't live with other flies, uh, once it lays its eggs, she leaves them to fend for themselves. She does not care for those eggs. And all of the flies have the same jobs. So this blowfly is a really good example of a solitary insect. The next potential level of sociality is subsocial. These insects communicate with each other. But in this case scenario, they also take care of their young, so they take care of their babies. But these insects don't all live together or have different jobs. 
An example of a subsocial insect is the giant water bug. In this case, the mother giant water bug actually lays her eggs on the back of the father giant water bug. And he will protect these eggs and make sure that they have the right amount of moisture from the water. And he'll take good care of them until they hatch. So here's a really great father giant water bug in this photo taking care of his eggs and making sure that they stay wet in the water, but not too wet. Another level of sociality is communal. These insects communicate with each other and all live in one area, but they don't take care of their babies and they don't have different jobs. So the example I have here is a digger bee. Each bee digs a nest in the ground and lays eggs in this nest, but does not care for them. And that sounds a lot like a solitary insect, but the difference is that lots of digger bees will all dig their nests in the same area, which makes them communal. So you might find a patch of dirt when you're on a hike, for example, and you'll see lots and lots of bees going in and out of their nests, bringing nectar and pollen and laying eggs and building new nests, and they're all in one group. So that's what makes a communal insect. The last level of sociality we're going to talk about is eusocial. And this is where we're going to focus most of the rest of the talk on is eusocial insects. Eusocial insects are the highest possible level of sociality. So they communicate with each other, they take care of their young, they all share a nest, and they have different jobs. So here I have the classic example of a eusocial insect, which is the honeybee. Honeybees all live with their brothers and sisters in one nest. There's a queen bee and workers that have different jobs. Um, one of those jobs is caring for the baby bees, right? Like we saw those brood cells before. Um, and you social is the highest level of sociality that we know to exist in the animal kingdom overall. So out of any animal in the whole world, this is as social as they can get. So I want you to go ahead and drop into the chat what other insects you think are you social. Of course, we discussed honeybees, but based off of what we discussed, what other insects do you think are you social? Seeing some answers coming in, it looks like ants is one of the most popular guesses, which is completely right. Awesome job. And of course, honeybees are you social as previously discussed. But let's talk about what other insects are you social. We have our honeybees and our ants here. But then in the top middle photo, I've got an ambrosia beetle. These are really, really small beetles that burrow into wood, typically into trees, like the bark of living trees. And they are eusocial. Something that's really interesting about them is that they are actually the only eusocial beetle in the world. So it's pretty unusual. So they're a cool insect to point out as being eusocial. Um, under those ambrosia beetles, we have some termites. Termites are also quite small insects, and they actually also chew through wood, but they don't live inside of trees like the ambrosia beetles do. Um, and they're the animals that made those big mounds that we saw um, in Africa. Then in the top right photo, just below me, we have aphids. If you like gardening, you're probably already familiar with aphids. Aphids are another very small insect that feeds on the fluids inside of plants. So they'll latch onto your plant and they're slurping up all the sugar and water and nutrients from inside the plant. That's how they survive. Um, and some types of aphids are eusocial, not all types though. And then another example of a eusocial insects are wasps. 
not all wasps, but some types of wasps are eusocial, like these paper wasps I have here in the bottom right. And while not an insect, I wanted to throw this in for fun. Naked mole rats are the only eusocial mammal, which I just find absolutely fascinating. So I had to throw them on as an honorable mention. Uh, they will have workers and a queen naked mole rat just like honeybees, which is absolutely fascinating to me. And this is the only mammal known to have this behavior. Eusocial behavior is much more typical in insects, so not something that we really see with birds, reptiles, or mammals, except for the naked mole rat. So now that we've learned a bit about what sociality is and some of the different levels of sociality and some examples of the types of sociality, that leaves us with the adaptations of social insects. And we're going to talk really in depth about these adaptations because social insects are incredibly fascinating with how they build their societies and the adaptations and modifications that come along with that. So the jobs of social insects can vary depending on the insect. For example, we have honeybees. Honeybees have different types of workers. So I've shown two different types of worker honeybees here, but there are more than that. This top left worker here takes care of the babies, as we were discussing with the brood cells and everything, versus this bottom left worker collects pollen and nectar for the hive. And we actually tend to find that workers will maybe do different jobs throughout their life. So when they're younger, they'll take care of the babies. When they get a little bit older, they might be a queen attendant, take care of the queen. They might move on to building honeycomb or cleaning the hive. And then later in their life is when they'll leave the hive more to go find nectar and pollen and other resources for the hive, which is pretty interesting. Of course, honeybees have the queen bee. I've circled her here in red so that you can see that she looks a little bit different from the workers. She's a little bit longer and skinnier. Um, and the queen will really never leave the hive. Her job is uh, to use her pheromones to communicate with the workers to determine what needs to be done in the hive. Do they need to move? Do they need to expand? Do they need to collect more resources? Do they need to lay more eggs? This type of thing. Um, and then the queen is the only um, member of the hive that will lay eggs for honeybees. Lastly, in the bottom right, I've got a drone. Drones are male bees, so the, the boy bees. Um, you can see he's pretty big and round compared to the girl worker bees. He also has these really big eyes. And the drones actually don't do too much in the hive except help the queen lay eggs. And that's really their only job, which is why you won't even see drones in the hive all year long. Here is another example of some insect jobs. These are all termites. So in the top left here, I have some winged reproductive termites. Their job is to lay eggs. Below that, there are soldier termites who protect the colony. You can see that this soldier has a really big head and these really big jaws for fighting. And we'll discuss a little bit more um, some of the soldier modifications in a bit, but that is one of the jobs that termites have. Honeybees don't have soldiers. Um, and termites actually don't just have a queen, they also have a king. Um, and similar to the queen bee, they're in charge of running the colony and also laying lots of eggs. Then below that, there are workers who do all kinds of jobs for the colonies. So let's delve a little bit deeper into some of these jobs. So first up, we'll start with the soldiers. We talked about soldiers having big jaws to defend their colony. When soldiers have these big, huge 
mandibles for fighting. That's called mandibulate. Uh, and some of these soldiers even have such big heads and mouth parts that they can't even feed themselves. So worker termites will have to go and feed some of these soldiers if their head is too big to even feed themselves, which is wild. But big jaws are not the only way to protect a colony. There are termites that are called nasut that have these long pointy noses that may be used to defend the colony. There are also termites that use something called phragmosis to defend the colony. They have these specialized big thick heads that they use to block entrances into their colony, which I think is just so cool. Uh, and termite soldiers aren't the only insects that use these techniques. Other insect soldiers, like these ants, use similar adaptations. So for example, on the left, I have a mandibulate ant soldier, and he has that ginormous head and those big jaws, just like we saw on the termite. And he is next to some workers. So you can actually see just how big the soldiers are compared to the workers. Then on the right, I've got a soldier that uses phragmosis. So again, you can see that big, thick head that the ant has. And it's very similar to the termite. And it will just use its head to plug up holes so that intruders can't get inside the colony. Now we'll talk a little bit more about workers. They can do all kinds of jobs. They will clean the nest. They gather food for the colony, raising the young, protecting the eggs and babies. They may protect the colony if there aren't soldiers like honeybees. The workers have to protect the colony because they don't have soldiers. There could be queen attendants to care for and to feed the queen. They could be working on building or repairing the nest. Um, and some workers are scouts who go out to look for new places to nest or new places to find food. So for example, occasionally you may see a scout ant on your kitchen floor, maybe just one or two of them. And if those scout ants determine that your kitchen floor is a good place to find food, a few days later, you'll see a lot more ants inside your kitchen because those scouts came, checked it out, determined that it was a good place for food, went back to the colony, reported that information, and brought lots of other workers to come and collect the food. So that's how you'll end up with some ants in your kitchen accidentally. But Scouts is a really interesting job. They may also be finding um, new places to go nest. So in this photo, for example, I have a honeybee swarm. These workers are protecting their queen as they move to a new hive. Uh, next to that, I have an aphid colony. The little fluffy white balls are aphids. And the aphid workers do all kinds of cleaning and repairs in their gall throughout their home. On the bottom left, I have some paper wasp workers who are caring for the babies in those brood cells. Again, those cells that are capped with white that have baby wasps inside. Then lastly, I have worker ants in the bottom right. Uh, and they're gathering resources for the colony. Some ants will eat plant material like that. Others will use it to create um, nests. So I think these ants are using those leaves for their, to build the inside of the nest. The next job we are going to talk about is the queen. Now the queens of every eusocial insect are a little bit different. So I've given two examples here the honeybee queen and the bumblebee queen. So I'll show you this really quick, short little video of a bumblebee queen working away. And then I'll talk a little bit about how the bumblebee queen and the honeybee queen jobs are different. So both have to communicate with the hive about what needs to be done. However, honeybee queens are really just in charge of laying eggs and that's about it. 
but bumblebee queens have to build their nest in the spring, forage for resources, and then lay the eggs herself. It's a lot more work for a bumblebee queen than for a honeybee queen. And I'll talk a little bit more in depth about bumblebee queens in a little bit. So I want you to go ahead and drop in the chat what insect job you think sounds the hardest. We've already got lots of answers coming in. Thank you for your awesome engagement. Some people think being a soldier and protecting the colony would be hard. I could definitely see that being a hard job. Others are saying workers have a lot to do. That's definitely the one I would say I personally think sounds the hardest. Being a worker insect sounds exhausting to me. So to finish off our talk today, I'm going to delve into some of the really cool examples of social insects and the amazing things that they do. Starting off, I have a Saharan silver ant here, which is one of my all-time favorite insects. They're really interesting. These ants survive in one of the hottest places on earth in the Sahara Desert. In fact, the highest ever recorded temperature in the Sahara was around 136 degrees. It can get very, very hot there. This makes surviving in the Sahara Desert very difficult. But this ant has special adaptations to handle these harsh conditions. So you can see that this ant looks almost reflective. It's covered in these silvery hairs that act almost like a space suit. They reflect heat away from the ant's body and back out into the air. But still, during the hottest parts of the day, the ant can only leave the nest for about 10 minutes. So in order to be very quick when collecting food, the ant will count its steps and keep track of the position of the sun to find the fastest route back to the nest after collecting food. They are amazing animals. So imagine the ant leaves its nest looking for food and it wanders around all over the place looking for something to eat. It finally finds something and has to bring it, you know, back here to its nest rather than making that same wandering path all the way back because that uses way too much time in this hot, harsh conditions, the ant had kept track of its position the whole time and it takes the fastest straight route back to the colony. They're really smart and great navigators. Another example of an amazing social insect are these aphid galls. These basically look like little fluffy white balls, but they are incredibly dedicated to their colony. When the aphids find a hole in their nest that needs to be repaired, they produce special fluids to fill that hole. However, when the aphid does this, often they end up dying because of how difficult this job is and how taxing it is on the aphid. So these aphids, will sacrifice themselves for the good of the colony. This is called altruism, and it's extremely rare to see behavior like this in animals. Our third example of some fascinating things that social insects do are acacia ants. Here is an acacia tree. And as you can see, these trees create these really interesting and specialized hollow thorns for ants to live inside. And the tree even produces a special nectar for ants to eat. In exchange, the ants that are living in the acacia tree will defend the tree from animals that might try and eat it. For example, beetles that might come and bore into the bark, the ants will fight them off. The ants will even tear up plants that try and grow too close to where the acacia tree is. It's such an interesting and complex relationship. It's a really fascinating one in the animal kingdom. The next amazing social insect I want to tell you about are stingless bees. Stingless bees are one of the other few insects that produce honey besides honeybees. Uh, stingless bees get their name because they can't sting. 
This has made them very popular for beekeeping in South America and Australia where they're found. And they produce these really beautiful spiral honeycombs that you can see that are very unique. But there is a small group of stingless bees uh, called vulture bees, but they're very, they're, you know, in the same group as stingless bees, closely related. They can't sting you and they produce honey. But rather than collecting their resources just at flowers and getting only nectar and pollen, these bees will also go and find rotting carcasses or a dead animal and collect their meat to bring back to their hive. And they'll produce a honey from this rotting meat. I don't know about you, but that honey sounds pretty gross to me, but so, so fascinating that these bees will do that. Next, I'll touch quickly on these ants that act as farmers. These ants actually treat their aphids as livestock. Because aphids eat the fluids inside of plants, they are constantly making something called honeydew because they're ingesting a lot of fluid all the time. They need something to, they, you know, they need to get rid of that fluid from their bodies. So honeydew is basically sugar and water. And these aphids are constantly peeing out sugar water and the ants want to eat that. Ants get energy and nutrition from the honeydew. So the ants will actually herd the aphids to the juiciest parts of the plant. And because the aphids uh, make food for the ants, the ants protect the aphids from predators like ladybugs and will even carry the aphids inside their colony to sleep at night. They're, they take good care of them, just like you would with cows or pigs or something like this. It's just amazing to me that nature has such complicated relationships. Lastly, I want to talk just a little bit about bumblebees. Um, so we talked a little bit about the work that bumblebee queens have to do, um, but I'm going to delve a little bit further into that. So in the fall, bumblebees will lay eggs that will become queens in the spring. The workers don't live over the winter like that. All the workers die by the end of the summer usually. Then these queens that are babies survive through the winter by keeping warm underground. And in the early spring, these queens will emerge from underground and they're ready to start their own nest. But usually in the early spring, it's still pretty cold, especially if you're in some of the northern states. And there might even be snow on the ground. Um, and if you don't know, insects are cold-blooded. They usually rely on the sun to warm them up. But these bumblebee queens have a special adaptation to deal with this. First of all, they're very hairy, which helps keep them warm. But they also use the muscles in their wings to warm up. The bumblebees will start pumping their wing muscles, which helps warm them during those cold spring mornings and gives them an advantage over some of the other insects because they can start foraging earlier in the season versus other insects that can't warm themselves up. And really this behavior is pretty much unheard of for insects. So I definitely had to share that amazing adaptation with all of you. But I am so excited to answer some of the great questions that I saw you all had. So I will turn it over to Haley. All right, so a lot of really wonderful questions, but one that came up very, very often when we were talking about our friend, the naked mole rat, and the fact that the naked mole rat is the only used social mammal, uh, ties back to humans. You talked to us a little bit in the beginning of the lesson about the sociality of, of humans. So could you tell us, do they bucket us as you social? Is there a different social category that we fall into? Talk to us a little bit there. Yeah, that is a great question. And it's actually something that scientists have debated quite a lot, whether or not humans count as eusocial. Some scientists will say, yes, we do. We have a lot of these traits. Others will say, well, no, we don't. And here's why. So uh, one of the big arguments against humans being eusocial is our job structure. So as we saw, 
the different jobs of insects had really distinct different looks. When we are born, we don't pop out looking like a firefighter or looking like a doctor looks, right? Everybody has more or less the same type of look. So, you know, we don't have special extra long arms if you're doing a job that, you know, you need to reach things really far, anything like that, like insects do. So that's one of the big arguments against humans being eusocial, but we are definitely very social animals in general, like we saw with the herds or flocks or some of these other animals. We also don't have a queen who like rules over all of the human universe and tells us all what to do. All right, so this actually already started to answer our next very common question, and that was whether bugs are always born with their jobs predetermined or whether there are certain types of bugs that like people kind of have to earn or work their way to a particular role. Yeah, that's a great question. And this is kind of where some of the different levels of sociality come in. So um, some of the levels that we didn't talk about, for example, you'll see that there are multiple queens born in one hive and they have to fight with each other to determine like who's going to be the queen. Um, but in some cases, yes, essentially the way the jobs work is like light switches is the way I like to explain it. So all of the insects have the same base, let's say, and then they have these five light switches. They're all turned on. Then as they develop some, for some insects, some of the light switches will go down, which will say, oh, that means you're a worker or just one will go down. Oh, you're a queen. So that's sort of how it works. It's quite complicated more than that, but in a very simplified version. Um, yes, some insects are born with their job, other insects are not and have to fight for that. Very cool. Now, speaking of the individuality of some of these insects, do you ever find cases where an insect might have a different level of sociality than other insects of that same type? Oh yeah, that's a great question. So this is actually something that's pretty common within different types of bees. Um, so there are bees called sweat bees, for example, and we actually see that at lower altitudes, so when they're not in the mountains, for example, that they are not social, so they're all solitary. And then when you move into harsher climates and conditions higher up in the mountains, they become social. So one of the driving factors, I guess, in what created sociality was harsh living conditions. So, you know, it's difficult to find food, it's difficult to find nesting resources. And so these bees would end up, you know, staying together in the same nest because it made their living easier. So yeah, that is a, a great question and something that we do see with some types of bees. Awesome. Now we also had a, a little bit of a safety driven question that may not have a great answer, but no answer better than the one you could provide us. So uh, how can we tell whether bees are stingless bees? Is there a good way to observe whether or not bees have the potential to sting us? Ah, that's a good question. Uh, I'll start off by saying we don't have stingless bees in America. So any bee you see, it's not going to be a stingless one unless it got here by some mistake. <laughs> um, and unfortunately with bees, it's quite difficult to determine the type of bee you're looking at without a microscope. The traits that you use to identify them are really, really teeny tiny. Um, but I will say the good news is that male bees don't sting. So boy bees never sting um, because the stinger is the same organ that's used to lay eggs. So only the uh, lady bees <laughs> are able to sting. And you can tell male bees apart from female bees pretty easily because they have these really big long antennae, um, which is a great way to tell them apart. They also tend to be sort of smaller. They don't typically have big mandibles because they're not doing any work, <laughs> really. They're just hanging around. So um, if you go out and you see a bee with really huge long antennae, like the one in the photo I had showed earlier, male bee won't sting you, totally safe. <laughs> 
Awesome. And that actually brings us really nicely to another question that we saw a lot of. So we saw a lot of different characteristics in different types of bees. And some of them we spoke about and explained, but we had some students who were wondering why different, uh, different genders or roles might have a different size of eye, even in the same species, mm. or why some of these other traits might be a little bit different. Is it not to everybody's advantage to have bigger eyes and see everything better? Talk to us a little bit more about some of those differences. Yeah, so typically um, smaller eyes is associated with doing some type of work. So especially um, if the insect has to dig around a lot or get into spaces, having big eyes, it's going to be, you know, these things are going to be bonking you in the face um, all the time. So the, for the male bees who are not really doing so much work and they're just hanging around the hive, you know, living in the lap of luxury, let's say, having big eyes, it, it doesn't matter for them because they're not you know, getting in the nitty gritty of things versus the female bees, you tend to find that they have um, smaller eyes, they'll have bigger um, jaws for chomping things and building things than the males do. Um, and that's just because they're doing a lot more work. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. Now, Given that you study primarily bees, we probably already have a decent answer to this next question, but of course, uh, your adoring audience would like to know what your favorite type of bug is. And if it's a bee, perhaps what, what favorite <laughs> type of bee you have? Yeah, so um, I love lots of different types of bees. It's a tough one for me, but uh, there are bees called cuckoo bees that I am particularly fond of. And they're really interesting because like a cuckoo bird, uh, rather than creating their own nest and collecting their own pollen and nectar for their babies, they are little thieves. So they will go to another bee's nest and steal all of her hard work and lay their eggs in her nest instead, rather than digging their own nest and collecting their own resources. They're, they're really lazy, <laughs> um, but they're so interesting and probably not a bee that most people have heard of. Wow. And we, we also had some students who, you answered a little bit of this question in something we spoke about a little bit earlier, but who were wondering whether bees change their level of sociality over the course of a year or for outside reasons. We talked a little bit about uh, certain, in certain insects movement, movements up the mountain and how that might change how sociable they are. Uh, but are there any other examples of cases where over the course of a year, their level of sociality changes? Yeah, definitely. And um, especially over the span of a few years. Um, so there are some insects that are kind of in this like limbo, let's say, where they're not really you social, they're not quite solitary, and they're building slowly towards higher social levels. So um, especially when they're living in a harsher conditions, like where there's maybe drought or they're in a desert, um, it's going to push them to head towards more social behavior. And we do see that over time, maybe one species that we didn't think was that social has actually become more social or we're seeing more examples of that bee being social. And also with wasps, this is something that's pretty common to see as well um, because during the summer months, they're living all together in one nest. And then in the fall, that nest um, completely collapses essentially and only the queens will stay over the winter, which is why in the fall you tend to see lots of wasps around your garbage cans and they're you know really annoying pests because all of those um, nests are collapsing and, and their society, let's say, is, is falling apart. Um, and this happens every single fall, just the queen will overwinter and she starts fresh in the spring. Wonderful. Now, as our final question for today, we got to talk a lot about how insects are in many surprising ways, very, very similar to humans. And it's gotten plenty of the class feeling very empathetic to our insect friends and wanting to know some things that they can do to help. So whether it's bees in particular or insects in general, what are some things that our viewers should be considering if they want to help these communities of insects? Yeah, definitely. So the biggest issue that insects are facing right now are declines due to habitat loss. So there is not enough food and there's not enough nesting resources for all of these insects. So a really great way to help them is by providing those things. So if you are able, if you have garden space to plant some 
plants native to your area or to provide um, an insect hotel or even watering dishes. Um, these insects will definitely utilize these resources. If you live in something like an apartment, you can even do window planters or work in a community garden, for example, um, and definitely advocating for these insects, you know, letting other people know that they are important and they do important jobs for us, not just providing honey, but also, you know, pollinating lots of fruits and vegetables for us to eat. Um, the more people that understand that, the better off that the insects are going to be. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Abby, and thank you to everyone who tuned in and asked such thoughtful questions and participated throughout today's lesson. I'm actually going to go ahead and tackle the final question, which is, can we go back and see this again later? So yes, definitely feel free to check out our YouTube page to watch this recording and maybe go back and listen once more to your favorite bug fact. And in the meantime, we hope that you will share those bug facts. So feel free to tag us on your favorite social media site. And if you're interested in learning more, whether that's about bugs, biology, language arts, or learning a new language, you're more than welcome to check out varsitytutors.com to learn more about our learning memberships. And with that, thank you so much. We'll see you all next time.